Good morning. I'm glad you can be with us for our worship service this morning. And uh, uh, hopefully that we're not too distraught. And hopefully our focus is on him because we know what? That God has blessed us with a great and wonderful thing. He is not shaken by what's going on in our land throughout the world. He knows what's happening. He's in control. He's sovereign, and he is still on his throne. So let's give him praise, focus, glory, and honor him in all we say and do. Let's open up with a word of prayer this morning. Almighty God, thank you, God, for your mercy, love, and grace. Thank you for God being the sovereign king, the ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And thank you, God, that you see us, Father, with love and grace and mercy. Well, I'm so thankful, God, of your son, what he has accomplished for us on Calvary, undeserving sinners. Thank you for the hope that we have only in him. Guide us and direct us, Father, and help us keep our eyes focused on you, and not on the troubles that's going on in this land. But God, focus on you, knowing, God, you're in control, and, Father, you are with us. Thank you, God, for this time that we can gather and open your word. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. And these things I ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Victory in Jesus. That's what we have because he conquered sin, death, and the grave. And he tells us with great assurance that, hey, you're going to do the same thing as well. Victory in Jesus. <laughs> us into victory because of what he accomplished for us on Calvary. We know that we have that great hope that we have victory in him because he did conquer sin, death, and the grave. He is now seated and seated at the right hand of the Father on high, making intercession for us. What great hope and assurance that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what we sing next, to him be all the glory. Oh 
greatest thing that he hath done is he came to this earth, an earth that he created to dwell among his creation, to be tempted, tested, live a completely sinless life, to bear the sins of the whole world upon him, to pay the penalty for sin, that sin that brings death, to give to pay the penalty for that sin, to give life back to all who are obedient. He paid a great price for us, undeserving sinners. For, our, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that for a moment. These emblems that we're about to partake of, the bread that represents his broken body, his body that bore God's wrath upon himself, his body that paid the debt for us, the blood that he shed cleanses us from our sins. It completely wipes it out. It washes it away to give us the hope of heaven. Scripture tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You know, Christ shed his blood so we could have remission from that sin to give us life. He died, he buried, and he was raised. And he tells us that if we are buried with him, you know what? We too be raised with him one day. He paid the price for our salvation, that wonderful gift of grace. What amazing love that truly is. As we partake of these emblems, let us focus on his amazing love, his grace, and the gift of salvation that he brought to a lost and dying world.
Let's pray. Almighty God, our wonderful Father in heaven, Father, it is truly an amazing love, Father, that you demonstrated through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, that love God demonstrated as he came and dwelled among his creation. Father, knowing why he came, to seek and save that which was lost, and Father, knowing the price that he would have to pay for the salvation of a lost and dying world, a world filled with wicked and vile sinners such as us. Father, a price that he would pay by bearing, Father, the punishment for our sins, becoming the perfect spotless lamb to pay a debt that was not his to pay, but Father, through his love and dedication and obedience. Father, we know he paid it for us in full. Father, I pray, God, you bless this bread that represents his body that was broken, that bore our sins and iniquity and paid our penalty, God, as he bore your just wrath against sin. Father, I pray, God, you bless the cup that represents his precious blood, his blood that was shed for the sins of the world to cleanse us of our wickedness and give us the hope of heaven. And Father, we're so thankful, God, that it didn't end with his death Father, we know, God, on the third day, he rose again. He conquered sin, death, and the grave. Father, to give us the hope of heaven. And Father, with that great assurance, we know that someday we can be joined together with you, united with you, and oh, Father, what a great rejoicing dinner that will be. Thank you, God, for these emblems. Thank you for what they represent. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. These things I ask in his name. Amen. Give you a few minutes to focus on what we're doing, what he paid for us, and then we'll come back with our morning message. As we open up this morning, the title for our message is No Complaining. Now, I want to ask you something. How many people here like to be surrounded with someone who constantly complains? I always call it the Eeyore Syndrome. Woe is me. You know? You know, I, I don't know about you, but when I'm around someone that, it just, it, no matter how good of a day that I've had up to that point, it drags others down, doesn't it? It drags you down. Someone that seems to be around someone who's constantly pessimistic, constantly negative all the time, then the problems that they have and what it does with that attitude is when you become that way. When you're around someone with that like that all the time, it has a way of rubbing off on you. And we find ourselves focusing then on the bad things that's going on in life, the trials, the troubles, the struggles that we're all facing, and then we become a complaining people and we're blinded of the blessings that God has already given us. We become blinded from his goodness. We become blinded from his grace and the hope that we have and the blessings he showers down upon us daily because his mercies are new every morning. He gives us new mercies every day and we become blinded to that when we're constantly complaining about what we're going through. You know, Jesus came and he died and he rose again. Why? Why? so we can have the hope of a new identity, a new identity in him. So we have become a new creation in him, completely created new, a whole new creation, a new creature as our Lord because of what he has accomplished for us on Calvary. 
what he paid for us. We just partook of the Lord emblem, Lord his emblems, and we focused on the debt that he paid in full for us. He conquered sin, death, and the grave. So we too can have that great assurance that someday we will live with him as long as we remain faithful. Revelation 2.10. So we've been given a great new identity in Christ, a new identity and new creation in him. We've been set free from the bondage of sin and raised into a newness of life with him. I love what the apostle Paul records in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 5 where he says this, or do you not know that as many of you who are baptized into Christ are baptized into his death? Therefore, if we were buried with him and through baptism into death, that just like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we'll also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You know, the Apostle Paul also records this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that we see this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what is he? He is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, Things, all things have become new. We are a new creation in him, a new creature, a new being, a person with a new set course, a new direction in life. My dad has always told me, and he stayed, I can remember this when I was growing up, or he always said this, you are the only person who can make yourself miserable. No one else can do it. You are the only person that can do it. And it all begins with our perspective on life, on what we're going through, or on the situation that we're faced with. And it all begins with our perspective on how we perceive what's going on. If you want to change your life, number one, you have to start by changing your story. You have to start by changing your story. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over, wanting something different, and expect the same result, expect a different result. You have to change. There has to be a change that takes place there. You can't be doing the same thing and expect a different result. No, something has to be different to get a different outcome. We all have the ability to control our destiny. Hmm. We all have that ability to control how well, I mentioned in the message last Sunday, what? That we're all going to make a choice. You're going to make a choice to either follow Jesus, you're going to make a choice to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. You're going to make a choice whether you're going to go out and do what he's commissioned us to do. We're all going to make a choice of who we are going to serve. You're either going to serve one of two masters. You can't serve both. You're going to make a choice. The choice is yours. However, by not choosing to follow God and what he has called us to do and be obedient to his will then life, in life, then what will happen? Well, we'll have a tendency to encounter a lot more difficult situations because essentially what are you doing? You're turning away from God and his graces as he wants to extend out his help to you. He desires for you to come to him. But so many times when he calls out for us, we turn away from his call. We don't take our burdens to him like he says, come to me and all you here weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. The thing is, if you're not satisfied with your story, and you're not finding fulfillment in the way that you lived your life up to this point, guess what? Then you're not alone. So many Americans, so many people, so many church members, and the world at large are all going through this. You're not alone. We as human beings have a tendency of complaining and not ever doing we love to sit back and complain about the situations that we're in and not ever doing something to take care of those situations. As a result, it reveals, what does it reveal? It reveals an ungrateful heart. Ungrateful for the blessings that God has given us. And we see this in the background text for our message today, what Israel was doing. Israel had been delivered. They didn't really have to do anything. they have been delivered from over 400 years in bondage to the Egyptians. God did all the work. 
on their deliverance. But what did they do when they come out of Egypt? What did they do? They were a grumbling and complaining nation. They were a bunch of Eeyores, if you will. Numbers 11, verses 1 through 3 tells us this. Now when the people complained, what did it do? It displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses and said, cried out, when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place to bear it because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. You know, this is a repetitive thing with Israel. They were a grumbling, complaining nation. They would constantly forget of all the graces and things that God has already delivered them from, what God has brought them out from. This is a constant repetitive thing for them, forgetting what God had done for them. And what is the result? We see something here. God was not pleased. God was displeased. His anger was aroused, we see that, as it's spoken here. If we're not careful, you know, I look at America today, I look at the church today, how a lot of times we are a grumbling and complaining people. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves falling into that same trap. We have to keep our guard up. Times can and will be difficult. Jesus told us that. It's not going to be easy. But times will be difficult. But what should we do? We should never, allow me to say this again, we should never allow the presence of trials to blind us from the graces, the love, and the gifts that God has already provided us with and his presence. Israel having been ordered, organized, cleansed, separated, blessed, taught how to give, reminded of God's deliverance, given God's presence and the tools and advanced the promised land as they were going. And now on the march to Canaan, immediately what happened? What did the people do? They began complaining once again. Woe is me. Why did people complain so much? Why do we complain so much as a people as a whole? Why are we constantly complaining? Well, Israel had hardships and trials. However, it was letting go of their past story even after they had been delivered that was the real issue. They couldn't forget the past and focus on the future and focus on what they should be focusing on. They couldn't forget the past even though God had already liberated them from over 400 years in bondage. They could not let that go and that was their biggest challenge. They were continually looking back instead of looking ahead. They were trying to look back behind them. I mean, think about it just for a moment. Think about this just for a moment. They were physically liberated from being slaves in Egypt, being beat with taskmaster whips, and constantly having to work as slaves. They were completely liberated from that, yet they did not mentally grasp the new identity, the change that had taken place, and what God had done for them as he flipped the script in their lives. They had not looked at it that way. They were looking behind instead of looking ahead than what God was doing. You know what, church? We too were once slaves as well. We were once bound in slaves and chains as well. We were bound in sin. But what happened? We're spiritually, liber spiritually liberated in Christ Jesus. We've been spiritually liberated in him. We oftentimes find ourselves looking back at how things used to be, how we used to live versus what God has blessed us with and looking for the present and the future and what God has entrusted us with. And while God is trying to flip the script in our lives and what we should do in the path that we're taking of our lives, we can often find ourselves caught in the trap of romanticizing over a toxic past that we were just liberated from. True change can only come when we mentally grasp and spiritually grasp the new identity that God has given us. The newfound freedom that we have in our lives. The new mercies, the mercy and the grace of the Lord as he extended and poured it out on us. And as much as we don't like it, as much as we don't like this next point, changing our story often involves facing obstacles. It does. It often involves facing hardships. 
It's not going to be easy or simple. It's not going to be a cakewalk. We're going to have trials and tribulations and suffering. But now we know that God wants the best for us, right? He wants and desires what's best for us. He desires to give us a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. But knowing that is only half of the battle. We can know it. That's only half the battle. We must, what must we do? We must embrace it. We must take hold of that hope and keep pressing on and keep fighting the good fight of faith. The Apostle Paul writes in his letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy. He says this, 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 11, 1, 6, 11 through 12. Sorry, says this. But you, O man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life which you were also called, having confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fighting requires what, church? It requires action. It requires something that we have to do. It requires focus dedication and what we're focused on can either do one of two things it can either build, build us up or it can tear us down it can break us apart or it can build and edify us up it takes action it takes focus and dedication on our part to create and change our lives but i want to get something straight here that would often think and if we're not cautious can lead us to think that we earn our salvation through works it's not that way at all it's not that way at all. Number three, salvation is one-sided. Now, allow me to explain something here. I'm not saying that, oh, there's nothing that we, we have to do. We still have to do our part. Salvation is not only one-sided, but I'm talking about the overall salvation is one-sided in the sense of this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, two, 8 through 10, the Apostle Paul says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. You know, we cannot earn our salvation. It is not earned, it is a gift. It is something that God gives to us. It gets a free gift given from him who bought and paid for our salvation. You know, faith in him is what he's accomplished on the, as the foundation of the truth. Faith is the foundation. Our believing is the foundation. We must be obedient to his commands, obedient to what he has called us to do and what he's accomplished for us. So instead of being a complaining, grumbling people, when we face moments of hardship, moments of trial, suffering, etc. When we go through those difficult moments of life, when it seems like we're taking those two steps forward, two steps forward, three steps back, like I pointed out last Sunday, instead of doing that, start focusing on the blessings that he's given to you in your life. How he's showered them down upon us daily throughout our entire lives. How he's always been there, but sometimes we neglect to look for him. Sometimes we allow things to blind us from his presence. We honor him by giving him the glory that he deserves. The glory in it all. James chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. James records this. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own free will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Think about that for a moment. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And he brought us forth. And God doesn't change like the shifting shadows. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That word of the gospel is how we witness to others. It's how we demonstrate to others. And it can have a huge impact on the church as a whole. The word of the gospel in growing and edifying one another or building them up or tearing them down. It can. It can either tear them down and push them away or draw them close by the way we live our lives outside the walls. Whether we're grumbling and complaining people, they should, people look at us and say, hey, I thought he was a Christian. <laughs> I thought she was a Christian. Watch, watch how they're grumbling and complaining all the time. One way we give God the glory is shine our light. 
shine our light that others may see him and glory, see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. On the other hand, we can push people further away from the truth by how we are living our lives. You know, everyone has a past. Everyone has a life that they used to live. We all have a past, and oftentimes our past holds us back from our future because we're focusing so much on the past rather than looking ahead unto Jesus. God desires us to look ahead. Don't focus on what you used to do in the horrible life that you used to live. Focus on what's ahead. Focus on Him. Now, if we're not careful, if we're not cautious, we can allow those past experiences that we've gone through in our lives to rule us and to steer the course of our lives in such a negative way that we never arrive at the destination we're pressing on for. Or the one we hope for worst yet, worse than that is we can let the past keep us from even hoping for a better destination or future. It's with determination to change your life, to change your story, to flip your script that we can and we will achieve almost anything we set our minds to. Remember what I said? Our minds, that's our focus. What we're focusing on, whether we're focusing on him or on the things of the world, the only way we can truly flip our script is to focus on him. Give him the glory he deserves. However, we cannot allow the experiences of our past to hold us back anymore. We must take captive of those things, captivating thoughts. And flipping the script is more than just letting go of past memories, past mindsets. It's redefining our entire course of our future. That's what it's about. The entire redefining, the entire future course of our lives. And if you want to change your life, and change your life and start by changing your story. It all starts with your focus and on who you are obedient to. One of the biggest hurdles, church, that we go through in life is that's holding us back from flipping our, flipping our script are the thoughts that we allow to play and replay in our hearts and in our minds over and over. Most of the thoughts we have in our lives when we look at it are what are negative thoughts. They're negative. They tear us down. Most of those negative thoughts we have are about ourselves and not even true. It's stories we make up in our own minds. You know, you ever heard the old saying that you can be your own worst enemy? You can be. We're often harder and more judgmental on ourselves than what we need to be. We can be our own worst enemy. So what do we do? How do we get over this hurdle? How do we get over it and start focusing on him and stop complaining so much? Where should our focus be? It should be on him. It was in the letter to the Colossians that the Apostle Paul records to who we are focusing and where our focus should be on. Number four, our focus needs to be on things above, not of this earth and not of this world. That's where our focus needs to be. It needs to be on things above, not on things of this world here on this earth. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says this. Then you were raised with Christ to seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died your life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You know, the Apostle Paul says to focus on the things above rather than the things here on this earth. Why? This earth is fading and diminishing. It is dying. It's fading away very quickly. It's going away. Focusing on things above helps remind us of where we are going, what we have been called to do, and what life we have waiting for us. Christian living. Let me say this. Christian living is built on the foundation of that theological truth of Christ himself and what he has done for us. Why? Because we know that Jesus is really raised from the dead. He rose from the dead and then our identification with him, once knowing this, it becomes very real for us. When we know that Christ raised from the dead and we follow through with the plan of salvation, our hope becomes very real for us in our mind. And it's only because we were raised with Christ that we can seek those things which are above. It's all because of him. It's not anything we've done. It's because of what he has done that we are able to seek those things which are above. The idea 
of being raised with Christ was introduced in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, where Paul used baptism to introduce spiritual reality. Now, seeing something here that we were raised with Christ and a certain behavior that we should have that is appropriate to us. Our focus should be only on him, giving him the praise of his glory, his blessings that he's given to us through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, and he has given us a great and awesome gift. So why should we be complaining? What gives us the right to complain? If anyone could have complained, it would have been Jesus. He didn't do anything to deserve the death that he bore. What he endured for us, he could have been the one complaining, but he didn't. He remained focused. He knew what he was doing. And he demonstrated his love for all of us. So, why should we be complaining? We should. It disheartens God. It displeases God, and our goal is to please Him. And if you want to change your life, you can start that this morning. We change it by changing our mindset and our direction and our focus. So what must we do? Well, you have to repent. We have to know we are a sinner to hear the gospel. Faith coming up by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What do we have to do then? Well, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What do we do then we believe? Well, we have to repent. Jesus tells us in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you will likewise perish. That means a change of heart, a change of focus, a change of direction. Stop focusing and dwelling in the past and start looking ahead to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and start following him. And stop following the ways of the world. So after we repent, we have to be willing. We have to surrender of ourselves and be baptized. Jesus uh, told us in John 35, Except a man be born, born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We also see this in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 or 38, on the day of Pentecost, just a few days after the crucifixion, we see them all gathered there, and Peter being full of the Holy Spirit stood up in front of them, and he told them plainly in the sermon, said, with wicked hands, you have crucified the son of the living God. And being cut to the heart, those in the crowd who heard this, they say they cried aloud with conviction, said, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do we do then? Well, we have to remain faithful unto death. That's where our focus is on. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Where's your focus on this morning? Is it on him? I hope so. I hope you're following him. The only way you can follow is to keep him in your sight picture. Stay focused on him and allow him to lead the way. When someone is leading, you are watching and you're following. If you're not a Christian, why not give your life to him today? <clears throat> Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine will the Thank you.
Thank you all for your great attention. I hope we can keep our eyes and minds, our eyes and minds focused and fixated on Him, what He has accomplished for us on Calvary. This week, that's the challenge. Don't focus on the bad things that's going on in the world around us. Focus on Him and His greatness, His goodness, and His glory. Follow Him. Let's pray. Almighty God, our wonderful Father in heaven, thank you, God, for the great hope and the great assurance that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, your Son. Thank you for the gift of salvation that he brought to a lost and dying world. Be with us, God, throughout this week and allow us to focus and stay, keep our eyes fixated on you. Forgive us of our sins and failures. Give us strength, guidance, and direction. These things I ask in Christ's name. Amen.